Hello and welcome to our first keynote of GTR Asia 2020 virtual, New Thinking in the Rules of Globalization. My name is Eleanor Rag and I'm a senior reporter with GTR. Joining me for the conversation is Michael Froman, Vice Chairman and President of Strategic Growth at MasterCard. I'm sure to many of you, Michael needs little introduction, but introduce him, I will. Um, from 2013 to 2017, he served as the US Trade Representative, President Barack Obama's principal advisor and negotiator on international trade and investment issues. During his tenure, Michael worked to open foreign markets for US goods and services and reach landmark trade agreements. Prior to that, Michael served at the White House as assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor for international economic affairs, where he was responsible for coordinating policy on international trade and finance, energy security and climate change, and development and democracy issues. He's also a distinguished fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations and has published a book and several articles on international relations, international law and trade. And in his current role with MasterCard, he's responsible for advancing the company's efforts to partner with governments and other institutions to address major societal and economic issues. So given all of his experience, we are delighted to have him here with us today to share his views on the future of trade and globalization in this unprecedented environment. Michael, welcome. Well, thanks, Eleanor, for having me. Thank you. So let's kick off. I mean, we, this comes at a very interesting time. Recent years have seen a series of disruptions to the multilateral trading system. Um, the current COVID-19 situation has certainly served to um, bring these into sharper focus. Um, one trend sort of nearshoring, so already a growing trend since the US-China trade war, now looks to have become more urgent as supply chains have been upended by rolling shocks worldwide. And trade has become increasingly entangled with geopolitics. Michael, from your perspective, what does this all mean for globalization? Well, as you said, I think this trend of the effect on global supply chains actually predates COVID. Um, I think it actually goes back to the rising costs, for example, of, of labor and other factors in China when companies began to reassess their, their supply chains. Then you had the U.S.-China trade tensions, which introduced more uncertainty into the equation. And that also led companies to think through their supply chains. And then COVID. And COVID as in, in this case, as in many other cases, has accelerated trends that have already been uh, evident before. Whether or not it leads companies to actually, in the US case, move back to the United States or Europe, move back to Europe, or simply to modify their supply chains to ensure that there is diversification, uh, that they look at it from an operational risk perspective, uh, so that they have redundancy, that they're not overly dependent on one market for production, that remains to, to be seen, but, but certainly companies are looking at their supply chains and looking at their incremental investments and through a new lens and taking that into account as they decide where to put their next, uh, their next factory. I think in terms of the geopolitics of this and what this might mean more broadly, you know, we have a, the potential that the tensions between uh, the U.S. and China, and between China and a number of other countries as well, including in Europe and, and elsewhere in Asia, that have the that potentially pose the challenge of of some degree of decoupling, of pulling apart. And the real issue is if we pull apart, whether it's from a technology point of view or from a supply chain point of view, what does that mean for global standards? can we maintain global standards and interoperability, which has been absolutely key to achieving the efficiencies of global trade, particularly for small and medium-sized uh, businesses, or are we gonna find ourselves in multiple blocks with different standards, which make it more difficult for small and medium-sized enterprises to play a role in global trade? And to me, that's the real question that we need to look at going forward. Uh, whatever happens with the US-China relationship, whatever happens with uh, supply chains, can we maintain those kinds of global standards that have contributed so much to international efficiency? 
Absolutely. No, great point. And, you know, you sort of mentioned the various different risks and the various um, challenges facing corporates, SMEs and even financiers and other actors within the global trade ecosystem. You know, what do they need to bear in mind as we look ahead to the coming months as they, you know, figure out a way to survive or try to thrive in this environment? Well, first, I think we need to, to, to make sure that um, while there may be this tendency for countries to pull back, for governments to pull back, that we just try and discourage uh, a natural inclination to jump towards some kind of national solution for every problem, a localization requirements and on soil requirements, um, trying to create national internets, national digital economies. I, I think the, the real issue is, because that, that tends to lead to local monopolies, to less competition, uh, an adverse impact on consumer welfare. The question is, can we achieve the objectives that governments need to achieve in a very legitimate way around privacy, for example, without uh, sacrificing the benefits of being part of a, of, a, of a growing global digital economy? And for the, for the participants in that economy, I think what it means is, is first of all, going digital. I mean, we saw that in the context of COVID, what was absolutely critical is for individuals and small businesses to be part of the digital economy, to move from being brick and mortar businesses, for example, to being e-commerce businesses. And as they do that, to make sure that they can conduct that kind of commerce and contact their suppliers and their customers in a safe and secure way. So being able to enhance cybersecurity and anti-fraud, those are all the things we're focused on helping small businesses, for example, move online and interact with their customers safely and securely and protect themselves from cyber attack or, or fraudulent behavior. Absolutely. Um, let's move to the Asian context, given that this is GTR Asia. So in recent years, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has emerged as a bit of a champion of trade liberalization and multilateralism. It was a big theme of last year's GTR Asia conference. Now, given this current, you know, the current economic and trade challenges around the world, do you think we can expect to see a greater focus on regional cooperation? And what will be the implications of this? Well, I think as we've seen, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is under a certain amount of challenge right now um, in all of its areas, whether it's negotiating new agreements, monitoring the compliance of countries with their commitments or dispute settlement. And there's a lot of focus on what needs to be done to reform the WTO. But in the meantime, the coalitions of the willing or coalitions of the ambitious are getting together in regional groupings, plurilateral groupings, to continue to pursue responsible trade liberalization and pursuing the strengthening of rules and standards as well. And certainly Asia has been very active uh, in this area, whether it's the uh, CPTPP or RCEP or relations between ASEAN and with themselves and with other with other countries, there's been a lot of work done to continue to reduce tariffs, continue to reduce non-tariff barriers, at the same time, strengthening standards and strengthening the rules-based system uh, where they can. And I think that's uh, that's very important. You know, I think one of the areas um, that, that I found when I uh, would travel in Asia that there's a great sensitivity to um, um, is precisely the costs of doing trade, the inefficiencies in the trading system. And you'll recall that the, the one fully multilateral agreement that the WTO has come up with in the last uh, 20 years or so is the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which truly really goes at trying to eliminate unnecessary frictions in the trading system. And it's remarkable this, the degree to which there are still frictions at the border, uh, how much of of transactions around B2B transactions are still done on paper, uh, in cash, in inefficient ways. Uh, uh, our teams tracked how many interactions there were, how many payments had to be made between a container pulling into a dock and ultimately making its way to the end, uh, to the end consumer. And it's something like over 40 transactions need to be done. And a lot of those are paper-based. A lot of those are are in cash or in check, which are highly inefficient. And so 
digitizing those trade processes, moving things to be online, um, not requiring hard copies of documentation to move something from one place to another. Those are all steps that can be taken. And Asia oftentimes has led the way in thinking through how trade facilitation can reduce frictions at a time when there are other tensions in the system. Some of these tensions we can't control, but the ones we can control tend to be the ones right at our border, how we handle our customs and how we handle our border controls, what happens at our ports. And if we can make those processes more efficient by digitizing them, by introducing electronic payments, for example, into the process, then we will take in a lot of the costs, a lot of the time out of trade and making it more efficient for those who are involved. And that's particularly important. Sorry to go on for so long, but that's particularly important when it comes to small and medium-sized businesses. Because big businesses, big companies, they have whole groups of staff who help manage these trade processes at ports, at the border. You're a small business, it can be overwhelming. And so few small businesses comparatively participate in the global trading system export. We have so much room for growth there. And, but it's only gonna happen if we make it easier for them to engage in the global trading system. And that can be done now through digitization. Absolutely, definitely. I mean, that sort of brings me to the next question, which is around resilience. So resilience is a word that I have heard sort of ad nauseum recently. It really is something that people are saying that people need in supply chains, you know, in order to get through a situation like we're seeing. But what does this mean in practice? You've already mentioned the fact that SMEs are at somewhat of a disadvantage. How can they change the way they do things in order to get through this situation, in order to strengthen their opportunities and their possibilities? Well, I think that first, really to, moving to the digital economy, if they're not already there, and becoming fully digital with all the cyber protection, anti-fraud protection that's available so that they can interact safely and securely, um, that creates an opportunity for them to become part of global supply chains. And, uh, you know, we've been working on uh, a product called uh, Track BPS, which is really about bringing small and medium-sized businesses into the supply chain in a more efficient manner, making it possible for um, supply chain managers to really understand the risks involved and include those small and medium-sized businesses and give them an opportunity to participate in, in global trade. But becoming digitizing, digitized, digitizing their electronic, their payments, they can do it through any number of electronic means, uh, uh, looking at procure to pay capabilities and making those digitized. Those are all steps towards becoming resilient, uh, as you say. Because otherwise, when there is a downturn, when people do begin to pull back, it's the small, medium-sized companies that are likely to bear the brunt of the downturn. And we see that, we see that in our neighborhoods with uh, neighborhood restaurants or stores that are having difficulties. But we also see it in the global trading system where uh, the small number uh, percentage-wise of small, medium-sized businesses that participate are under particular stress, whether it's in terms of getting access to financing or being able to participate in those global supply chains. Yeah. Now, as I've interviewed CFOs around the world for various articles, um, what has come across is that scenario planning has become a bit of an extreme sport, to be honest. I mean, what's most notable about this current crisis is that while we can certainly dust off the lessons that we learned during, for example, the global financial crisis, the scale and the magnitude of the economic, financial and business upheaval that we're seeing is really unlike anything we've ever experienced. So my question to you is, who will write the playbook for the future that we're moving into? You know, is it governments, is it corporates or, or consumers? I'd say all of the above. I think one thing that this crisis points out is, uh, on one hand, there is certainly a role that only governments can play uh, in the global uh, economy and the global ecosystem. And we need governments to step up um, and uh, um, not be paralyzed from taking the actions that are really only appropriate for them to take. Um, and there are, there's a role for philanthropy too, by the way, and we have some really proactive work being done. You know, we, we've done work at MasterCard with the Gates Foundation and Welcome in the UK to create a COVID-19 therapeutics accelerator to help bring uh, treatments for COVID to the market more quickly, 
than they otherwise would happen. Make sure they're available to people all over the world, whether they're in rich countries or in poorer countries. Uh, so there's a role for philanthropy too. But the, the bottom line is neither governments nor philanthropy have all the tools and all the capacity they need to address these kinds of challenges. And the private sector very much has a role uh, to play. And so that's, again, on everything from accelerating digitization, making sure there's interoperability, making sure there's inclusion, making sure that the, the efforts that we're taking um, may include individuals and small businesses who might otherwise be outside the, the formal economy, outside of the financial system. And the challenge for the private sector is to do this in a way that isn't just a hobby, it's not just for public relations purposes, it's not done, as we say, on the side of the desk, but it becomes part of their core business strategy because they recognize that they, they benefit from healthy, thriving economies. And so there's a long-term value in, for the company in investing in, in these sorts of efforts. And the other challenge facing uh, private companies, but I think there's a lot of progress being made there, is figuring out how to partner to get this done. No company or set of companies can do this on their own. They need to find new modes of partnership with each other, with governments, with international organizations, with nonprofit organizations that are doing work in the field and be seen not just as a contributor of philanthropy, as a making of grants, but as an operational partner in trying to deliver their expertise, their technology, their innovation to the field to address these kinds of issues. Uh, again, we're involved in a whole range of these areas, whether it's our partnership with Gavi, the, the Vaccine Alliance, to help them deliver vaccines more efficiently in the countries in which they operate, or, or our partnership with Unilever to, in a local bank in Kenya, to provide new ways of looking at credit for micro merchants so that they can buy more from Unilever, sell more to their customers, and pay back their, their bank in a way that they've never and never been able to get credit before. And so uh, looking at new ways of using our technology, our network, our expertise to try and address these broader, these broader issues, I think is a, is a model for the private sector as well. I think the, the point that you make there is really important that the private sector certainly needs support in order to drive the, the sort of the economic recovery and, and the growth in trade that we need to see so that trade can continue to support things like poverty reduction, financial inclusion and so on. But also, as you've mentioned, there are, this appears to be happening sort of in pockets, no? Um, you mentioned sort of the coalitions of the willing and, and, and certain blocks of countries that are potentially being more liberal while others are being less so. Do you see that there's a risk of a potential polarization where we, we end up with almost a two-speed world post-COVID in terms of trade? Well, there is always that risk, but I also think there's an opportunity in that the advent of the digital economy uh, it will allow countries and businesses in those countries to perhaps leapfrog the normal or the historic path towards development. And so you know, the, 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 we're connecting farmers right now in Africa and in South Asia to global markets with our MasterCard Farmers Network. That's something that wouldn't have been possible necessarily 20 or 30 years ago. And so for a farmer in the field to be able to access global prices and understand what they can get for their product, decide when to harvest it, when to sell it, get higher prices for it, support their families better. Um, we're putting coffee workers in Mexico on a digital payment platform. And it turns out they're getting paid 20, 25% more than they were before for their product because we've cut out the middleman. And so I think, yes, there's the risk of a digital divide, but digital economy also creates that opportunity for people who might have been left outside the system previously to now join uh, the global economy and to benefit from it. It does take a proactive effort. You know, we five years ago, we committed to bring half a billion people into the financial system. And we measured it, these are unbanked individuals. We measured it just like any other you know, uh, key performance indicator of our business with every region, every country having, having targets. And we achieved it about nine months ahead of schedule. Uh, and in the middle of COVID, we, we looked around the world and we said, you know, what COVID points out is the critical importance of being connected digitally to the networks that create that pathway to prosperity. And therefore we're gonna double down raise our goal to a billion people 
bring in 50 million new micro and small merchants into the digital economy, focus on giving tools to the 25 million women-owned, women-run, small, medium-sized businesses around the world. And that's just one company. And I think lots of companies can do similar things in their own areas, their own areas of expertise to make sure that this next generation of development is really based on inclusion. Now, a lot of what you've said, sort of the, the message in there is one very much of optimism and of hope, which is great to hear. But is it overly optimistic? I mean, are we dreaming to think that COVID-19 can usher in this new inclusive future for global trade and the finance that supports it? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I am an eternal optimist. Um, I think, it, as a former trade negotiator, you have to be to get through the day. Um, but I, I think, uh, I think there's there's a basis for it. Um, and I'll you know, just to focus on on U.S. companies for a moment. We've had a debate in the U.S. and it's broader than the U.S. about the role of the corporation in society. You know, it started with uh, letters from Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, a couple of years ago. Two CEOs instructing them that they need to be focused not just on short-term financial results, but also social impact. And last year, about a year ago at this time, the Business Roundtable issued their statement, the Association of Major CEOs, about how the, the various stakeholders that, that businesses needed to serve in their, in their objectives. So I think this debate has been going on. And then when COVID hit, we saw the impact of COVID, the impact on small business, uh, in the U.S., uh, the impact on the, the impact of racial disparities and the racial reckoning that's going on in the United States right now, it's really put to the test those words and those promises. And companies are, are beginning to step up and say, OK, you know, I've, I've, I've got to deliver financial results, but I've also got to invest for the long term, which means investing in healthy, inclusive societies, inclusive in all of its forms. And that, I think, is a good reason to be optimistic, is that this is much higher on the agenda of CEOs and boards of directors to look at, okay, what's the role of the company in creating long-term value, long-term value, including for employees, customers, suppliers, and the communities in which we operate? Fantastic. Another question for you is sort of more on the, the risk aspects, sort of the negative aspects. You know, we, we've talked about all of these opportunities that exist to make this future happen, but there are also so many um, risks that we miss the chance. What in your mind are the biggest barriers that we need to overcome in, in the short term in order to use this moment to its greatest potential? Well, I imagine it will vary a bit country by country. We, we have a lot of... of governments right now that are um, not as fully functional as one would like um, to step up to the needs of the, the crisis. And that's not a partisan comment. This isn't um, uh, limited to the United States. I think we see it in many parts of the world that governments are having difficulty mobilizing all of the capacity that they should have to address these kinds of issues. It underscores, again, the need for uh, the private sector to step up uh, as well. Um, so when I look ahead, I think uh, one of the obstacles we need to overcome is within countries, building the political will necessary to take on these kinds of challenges. Um, and among countries, uh, we need to be focused on building partnerships with between countries and between regions um, to really address these, these, these overall issues. There are a lot of issues out there that can't be solved by any one country, any one government alone. It takes a collaborative effort. And you know, at a time when there's a lot of populism and nationalism around the world, um, that kind of international cooperation is challenged. We need to find ways of addressing legitimate concerns about sovereignty, um, but at the same time, finding ways to collaborate with each other to address these concerns, whether it's climate change, whether it's new obstacles being put up to international trade, whether it's uh, development challenges, dealing with poverty, dealing with global health. 
think is my final question, just to take us back to the key theme of globalization. So, you know, reports of the demise of globalization and the multilateral rules based trading system have abounded <laughs> in recent years and months. You know, you mentioned the challenges um, around sort of reforming the WTO, for example, as well as various trade tensions. Um, in your view, I mean, you know, your career has seen you fly the flag for global trade for many, many years, and you're probably one of the best placed people to answer this question. In your view, will the global, um, the, the system of globalization, the multilateral rules-based trading system survive this crisis? And what do we need to do to make sure it continues to deliver on its promise of lifting people out of poverty and distributing wealth around the world? Yeah, I think we need to take that in, in pieces. Um, I think one of the, the challenges of, of maintaining the consensus of political support, which is necessary in order for globalization to continue, has been the, the failure in some countries, and I'd say including the United States, to really recognize the, uh, the disparate impact that technology and globalization have on different parts of the community and making sure that we have all the tools in place to help workers succeed in a rapidly changing economy. Again, whether that change comes from technology or from globalization. In the US's case, most of it comes actually from technology and technological development. Uh, but wherever it comes from, making sure that people have the tools to do lifelong learning, to change their skills, to add to their skills, uh, that they have the benefits that they need uh, it's the, the, the portable benefits that maybe having several part-time jobs rather than one single job with one single employer who has traditionally in the past provided them with all of these benefits, they are gonna, may have to stitch together a different benefits from different sources in order to, to, to support their family. And so being able to create systems like that. So there's a domestic piece of this in and of itself. On the international side, I think a lot of the concerns that have been raised about the global rules-based trading system are legitimate. And one of the greatest challenges we have is figuring out how to incorporate and include a, a country as big and as important as China uh, into the world's in, world trading system when it follows a very different set of rules than the rest of the, the global trading system. And that's something that's not just a US concern, it affects every country around the world. So we've got to take that seriously. We've got to make sure we're engaging with China in a way to really figure out how to incorporate them into the global trading system, but not in a way that has an adverse impact on, on the, the, the other, uh, other, other parties um, and their legitimate interests. Um, and then I think focusing not so much on whether the multilateral trading system of the 1990s or early 2000s is the ideal system, but what do we need to do at the regional level what do we need to do among uh, group, groups of countries willing to take various issues like the digital economy further to get things done, to continue to make progress? Now, right now, the WTO, there's a negotiation going on on the e-commerce agreement. That would be a really good thing to get, to get done to help establish some principles around the digital economy, around data flows. Um, and if we can go further in regional agreements, whether it's uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement that was recently Past or some of the agreements that the EU have negotiated or some of the agreements across the Asia Pacific, uh, like CPTPP, then we can begin to raise the standards of global trade more broadly and put the building blocks in peace, however one might get there. Thank you, Michael, for your comments. So we've heard today that while the world of trade is facing um, era-defining challenges, there are also opportunities to build back better as we seek to chart a course through the current situation. So although um, there remain several bumps in the road ahead and certainly not all are going to weather the storm that is, is, that's upon us, um, we have before us an opportunity to rethink the way we do trade and ensure a more equitable and inclusive future. So Michael, thank you very much for joining us today and um, thank you to our audience for listening in. Thanks for having me.